So if the person you're sitting next to doesn't look like they're ready to receive, just change roles. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. just, just, just look at them and say, if you ain't ready to receive tonight, I'm going to have to switch seats. I'm, I'm, I'm going to have to switch seats because nastiness is, an, is, is contagious. Bad spirits are contagious. Matthew 25, 14, watch this. For the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country. He called his own servants and delivered his goods to them. And to one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, to each according to his own ability. In other words, what he could handle. Please understand, whatever you have been given is what God knew you'd be able to handle. Stop wishing you had more and stop wishing you had less. He gave you what he knew you could handle. Took his name and said, you got exactly what you can handle. Mm -hmm. Then immediately he went on a journey. Then he who had received the five talents went and traded with them and made another five talents. What did traded mean? He means he did business. Look at his name and say, do business. Uh, he did business. He did not sit up and just wait for God to bless something. He went out and made God, uh, gave God something to bless. I'm going to say it again. He did not just sit and wait for God to bless. He went out and gave God something to bless. What's this? He says, verse 17, and likewise, who had received two gained two more also. So he did business too. Verse 18, but he who had received one went and dug it in the ground and hid his Lord's money. After a long time, say long time, which means that he didn't find himself in a rut overnight. It had been a continual process of him going down the tubes, going down the drain, and then finally, he, uh, verse 19, after a long time, say long time. Uh, the Lord of those servants came and settled accounts with them. Watch this. So he would receive five, came and brought five talents, saying, Lord, you gave me five. Look, I gained five more besides them. His Lord said to him, well done, you good and faithful servant. You were faithful over what? A few things, so I'll make you ruler over what? The many things enter into the joy of the Lord. Let me just stop right here and insert this. Money is always a test for power. God always uses money to test how much influence he can give you. Okay, maybe I'm speaking in tongue and you can't interpret. God always uses money as a way to determine how faithful you will be because if you cannot be faithful with money, you will not be faithful with anything else. If you cheat on money, you'll cheat on your spouse. So he uses money as a test. Somebody say money is a test. Uh, watch this. He says, verse 21, enter into the joy of your Lord. All right, the abundance is what the word, uh, the phrase, the joy means. Verse 22, he also who had received two talents came and said, Lord, you gave me two. Look, I got two more. Verse 23, his Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I'll make you rule over many things. Enter into the joy of the, your Lord. Now watch this. They got two different amounts, but they got the same reward. Please understand, God is not looking to see who has more, you or your neighbor. He's just looking to see if you both can apply the same principle, faithfulness. And if you can apply the same principle, you'll end up getting the same reward. Now watch this. Verse 24, then who had received one talent came and said, Lord, I knew. Underline that. Highlight that. Circle that. Put a smiley face next to it. Text it to your neighbor. Whatever you got to do. Lord, I knew, which means this. He knew his Lord's will up front. There was no guess. There was no question. There was no wondering. He knew up front how his Lord was. Watch this. He said, Lord, I knew you to be a hard man. Say this with me. Say he knew his will up front. He said, Lord, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you had not sown, gathering where you had not scattered seed. And I was afraid and went and hid your talent in the ground. Look, there you have what is yours. Now he's thinking he's doing a good thing. He's saying, listen, at least I didn't lose nothing. But what you don't understand is that God, when you go back to him, he's not just looking to see if you're the same way he put you here. He's trying to find out whether or not you made any profit with what it was that he gave you. Isaiah 48, 17, I, the Lord, teaches you how to profit. I teach you how to give more than what you started with. Look at the neighbor and say, are you profiting? And watch this. I'm not just talking about money. But are you better today than you were three months ago? 
are, are, are you better today than you were a year ago? Because if you are not, and you go back to God and say, well, at least I'm still here. God says, that's not good enough. <sighs> okay. All right, watch this. Watch this. Verse 26. But his Lord answered and said to him, now he thinks he's going to get a reward. He said, man, first dude got a reward. Second dude got a reward. Bring it, Jesus. Come on. I'm going to get my reward. Get my promised land. And then all of a sudden the conversation turns. The master's happy and excited until this dude walks up. This man walks up and all of a sudden now his whole demeanor changes. And he says, look, what you gave me, I'm giving back to you. In the same condition you gave it to me. Anything God ever gives you, he wants it back greater. Parents, God wants the child back greater than what he was when he gave him to you. Are you getting to what I'm saying? Now watch this, watch this. His old demeanor changes, he says, you wicked and lazy servant. So he ain't just wicked, he lazy too. You knew my will. Or in other words, you knew that I reap where I had not sown and gather where I had not scattered seed. So you ought to deposited my money in the bank, and at my coming, I would have at least received my own back with some interest on it. Therefore, take the talent from him and give it to him who has ten talents. For to everyone who has, more will be given, and he will have abundance. But from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away. Here's what we got to get, Bible College. And cast the unprofitable servant into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Uh, look at verse 30 again. And cast the unprofitable servant into outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Uh, God, give us an ear to hear tonight. I pray that as this is delivered tonight, God, that it would bring clarity, it would bring understanding into the lives of your people, and we bless you for it now in Jesus' name. Somebody say amen. amen. High five two or three people on your way down and say, into the outer darkness. This is going to be real quick. Uh, please understand, please understand, God's desire for you and I is that anytime he gives us something, we always give it back to him in a greater way, in a greater measure than he originally gave it to you. Please understand, talents in this parable were not referring to literal talents or the ability to do something. It was a measure of money. However, the principle is interchangeable, which means God could give you a talent, and if with that talent you do nothing with it, God looks and says, you are unprofitable. Because out of what I've given you, you were so busy looking at what you didn't have that you never took account of what you did have. You're not hearing what I'm saying. Your neighbor's so worried about what is not working that they're not paying any attention to what is working. And the problem is the enemy wants to get you distracted with everything that's not working and everything that's not going right so that you pay no attention to the things that are going right and the things that are working because whatever gets your focus is what gets your energy and whatever gets your energy is what you feed and whatever you feed is what's going to grow. And that's why some of your lives have Freddy Krueger and Jason them up in your life because you feed that and so they grow. Are you still here? Now watch this. He says, cast the unprofitable, the one that did nothing with what I gave him. And as we are uh, on the eve of Thanksgiving, we got to look and we got so much to be thankful for. And the reality is, is that we look and a lot of the times people, they look at finances and maybe they're not uh, where they want them to be. But what you don't understand is that you rich. Look at them and say, you rich. I'm not just talking about spiritual riches. I'm talking about natural richness. But what are you talking about? That's, I'm speaking about faith. No, you ain't got to speak that by faith. In the world, more than 60% of the world makes less than $2 a day. So if you make more than 600 and some odd dollars a year, you're rich. You're richer than 60% of the world. You never tell them, say, you're rich. I'm real rich. Loaded, because some of y'all make $100 a day. Loaded, man. Watch this. God says, anything I give you, I want it back in greater condition. But you'll never be able to give it back to me in greater condition when your focus is on everything that is not right. 
Uh, several weeks ago, I had, you, I had you flipping your Bibles to Psalm 23, and I had you to read the whole thing. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And all that, and we read that, and the beautiful promises. He'll make a table for me in the presence of my enemies. And everybody shouted, and then we put a dot in the book, and we closed the book, and we open it back up. And when you open it back up, you did not pay any attention to the beautiful promises you just read in Psalm 23. Instead, you focused on that dot. Now watch this. Watch, watch this. Touch your neighbor. Say, he's going somewhere. The enemy's desire is to get you to operate in such a level of fear that you never ever take any risk because to be profitable in life requires you to take risk. Which means that God says the only way you're really going to advance or grow is that you're going to have to get up out of your comfort zone because as long as you stay in what's comfortable for you, you'll never ever be able to grow. And so God says, I'll put you in situations, I'll put you in places, I'll put you in predicaments where you have no option but to grow, where you have no option but me. Because I'm sick and tired of your Adam nature jacking you up and robbing you of everything I've ordained for you. God says, I am come that you might have life and life more abundantly. But that thief called Adam, it robs you. So now watch this. So now watch this. Now, now watch this. Watch this. Because here's, here's the thing. Verse, verse 30, look at it again. And cast the unprofitable servant into the outer darkness, which means the outer darkness is a place. Look at your neighbor and say, that's a place. Mm -hmm. Where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, I asked you this on Sunday. I said, how many people think that that's talking about hell and dying and going to hell? And, and only a couple of y'all was honest. The rest of y'all need to get saved. But most people read that and think that weeping and gnashing of teeth, that's talking about hell. And, and, and I did this illustration. Gnash your teeth. Do it right now. Gnash your teeth. Gnash them. You know. right. 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 Now that's biting. Now, that. <laughs> Gnashing side to side. I can't hear you doing that. I can't hear you doing that. Now, watch this. Watch this. Uh, say weeping, gnashing of teeth. Say it again. Say weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now watch this, <clears throat> and this is why you need to be in Bible college. In Bible college, you'd be taught to recognize some things about the verse so that you'd be able to get a full understanding or what's called an exegesis of the verse. Now watch this, uh, an unprofitable servant into the outer darkness. The outer darkness, I told you, is a what? Place. Here's what the phrase means in Greek. It means obscurity, unknown, watch this, or the absence of light. Obscurity, unknown, or the absence of light. So now God says my remedy for people that will not get out of their comfort zone is a place called obscurity, the unknown, and the absence of light. Notice it was not the man's enemy that threw him in the outer darkness. It was the man's Lord that put him in the outer darkness. Would y'all talk to me? It was not his enemy that put him in that place. It was his master that put him in his place because his master understood some things about him that he would not understand the importance of being profitable unless he was put in a predicament where he had no other option but to be profitable. There's stuff going on in your life and God says the devil didn't do that. I did that. And I did that because I knew you weren't going to get out of the boat on your own. So I didn't let you get out the boat like Peter. I turned the boat upside down and made you get in the water. You're not hearing what I'm saying. Uh, watch this. Watch this. Watch this. Watch this. The outer darkness. Obscurity. Unknown. Which means if it's unknown, it's uncomfortable. Uh -huh. Because anything I know, I'm comfortable with. You, you, you go and you'll walk in a room and find the people you know because you're comfortable with them and you'll sit with them and eat with them and talk with them and all that. But God says, I'll sit you in a room where you don't know nobody. Because, because, see, what I got to get out of you is I got to get some profit. I got to get some fruit. I got to get some results because, see, uh, my word shall not return to me void, Scripture says. Now, look at your neighbor and say, you are the word. 
How do I know that you're the word? Because the scripture teaches us in Jeremiah, before I formed you in your mother's womb, I knew you. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. I sanctified you, which means that before you ever existed, God spoke you. But before he spoke you, he fought you. Which means that he fought me, then he spoke me, which means I became a word, which means I am his word that has been sent, and y'all ain't saying nothing, that has been sent into the earth. And I cannot return back to God void or fruitless or unprofitable. Are you getting this? And so now God says, you are the word. I feel like preaching tonight. He says, you are the word that I've sent and you're not coming back to me void. You're not coming back to me jacked up and messed up and broke and busted and this. You're not. Don't you know? Come up back here like that. Don't you go out. I, I gave you all of this ability and talent and resources and connections. Don't you come back to me with nothing. I've given you all this word and all these tapes and CDs and books and books. Don't you come back to me with nothing. Uh, parents, think about this. If you send your child out, you give them $100, and you say, go, do business. Get yourself some stuff. Make some stuff happen. Now, here's the reality. Because of the way we've, we've, we've done generational stuff in America, your child will come back with a shirt and some shoes for $100. But where I'm from, that hundred dollars, that money's gonna be invested. It's gonna be used. I'm gonna set up a lemonade stand. I'm, I'm gonna see, see. You better learn something. When life gives you lemons, don't just make lemonade, man. You better go make you a lemonade stand and make some profit. So you give them a hundred dollars, they come back with, I got some Air Force Ones. How many pairs? One. <laughs> I, I, I'm sorry, I, I don't understand. I, I don't understand how it is that I gave you $100 and you came back to me with one thing that can't produce you any more results. You wear them shoes, they ain't worth nothing no more. And so we've taught now, we've taught our children and our generate. we've taught them how to be consumers and not how to be rural. Uh, and how to rule and how to reign. We've taught them how to just make sure that they always need something, but they're not providing the need. Look at the neighbor said, that's got to change. Uh, we've taught them how to use credit card and Amex and Visa and MasterCard and Diners. We've taught all of that, but what we have not taught is how to rule and how to reign and how to be the lender and not the bar. God's just not going to magically make that happen. That's something we got to get out and make happen. But now watch this. God says, you are the word because I spoke you. And before I spoke you, I thought you. That's why he says, Jeremiah 29, 11, I know the thoughts and the plans that I have toward you. Which God says, all day long, I'm thinking about you. <sighs> Touch your neighbor and say, he's thinking about you. Uh, God says, all day long, I sit up thinking about you, thinking about how to get you to the next level, thinking about how to get you to the place I've ordained. All my time is spent tied up, tangled up, wrapped up thinking about you. <sighs> That's your neighbor say, why? Because uh, he wants fruit. Uh, he wants profit. Now, please understand. Uh, I'm not just talking about, so do not marginalize what I'm saying to money or to material things. God says, I want to see the fruit of the Spirit. I, I want to see some love. Because see, see, you've been mean all your life, and, and that ain't how I am. And so as far as God's concerned, if you mean and save, you're still unprofitable, which means you're wicked and lazy. You hear what I'm saying? If you don't know how to, how to have patience with folk, but you save, God says, that's nice and all, that's cute, and that's great, but you wicked and lazy because that ain't, I, I'm looking for fruit. I'm looking for profit. Ain't no such thing as non-profit in the kingdom. Don't exist. That's a man-made concept. It's demonic. Read your Bible. The, the, the church, the kingdom, was the biggest for-profit organization that ever existed. Read, read, read your Bible. This is an interesting book. I tell you. Change your life. Watch this. 
Verse 30, I'm about through. Cast the unprofitable servant into what? The outer darkness, which means what three things? Obscurity, the unknown. Watch this. The absence of light. Now watch this. Light is the knowledge of God. That's why the first thing God did in Genesis, Genesis, the beginning, the origin of things, the first thing he did is he said, let there be me. He did not create literal light until later on in the chapter. The first thing he did is he said, let there be the knowledge of me. Because when there's chaos and when there's hell going on, the first thing got to happen is orders got to show up. And orders showed up when daddy comes home. So when daddy steps through the door, the first thing he says, turn on them lights. I know they told you to turn them off. But God said, turn them on. Touch your neighbor and say, turn them on. Turn now watch this. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now watch this. Outer darkness into the outer darkness, period. Read your, look at it. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, which means it's another sentence, which means it's another statement. Which means in outer darkness, at the moment the person got sent, there was not weeping and gnashing of teeth going on. But now once they get into that place, they're going to get to a place where they begin to weep and gnash their teeth. I need you to stay with me. Touch your neighbor and say, he's going somewhere. Which means God says, when I place you in outer darkness, it does not start with weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now see, that may confuse you because you don't understand what the phrase weeping and gnashing of teeth refers to. But I'm going to show you that in just a moment. He says, when I place you there, there is no weeping and gnashing of teeth. But after you've been there for a while... You're going to weep and gnash your teeth. Now, the cross-reference, which uh, suggests the hermeneutics of the scripture, takes us to Psalm 112. Go to Psalm 112. 112. Cupid. <laughs> Y'all are supposed to be saved. Y'all are supposed to be saved. I thought this was a church. Give him a try. All right, here we go. Now, the cross-reference in your Bible will take you to Psalm 112, verse number 10. Now, whenever you see a cross-reference in your Bible, it is helping you to gain the totality of what the verse is speaking of. All right? So all them lines and A's and B's and C's and 1's and 2's and things you got in your Bible, that's not just stuff for the preacher. That's stuff so you can look at it and then figure out, oh, this is where this comes from. These are how these things connect. You learn that stuff in... Bible comments. Say Psalm 112. So this is the chapter now that introduces the concept of weeping and gnashing of teeth. Look at your neighbor and say, that's not talking about hell. It's talking about the one you create for yourself. Psalm 112 verse 1. Now watch this. Praise the Lord. Or the word there, praise, is, is Hebrew, hallelujah, hallel, the highest praise. Say it, say hallelujah. hallelujah. In every language, hallelujah is the same. Because God reserved that word for himself because it, is, it means the highest form of praise. Watch this. Blessed is the man who fears the Lord, who delights greatly in his commandments. So watch this. Delights greatly means respects. In his commandments. Watch this. Blessed is the man who fears the Lord. Who delights greatly in his commandments. Who respects and obeys his commandments. Now. It is safe for us to say that God's commandments. Are something he did what? He spoke. Now. Which would suggest to us that his commandments are his will. Because he spoke it which makes it the word. And the word is. Say again. Say again. All right. Now, watch this. Verse 2. His descendants. Whose descendants? The one who fears the Lord and delights greatly in his commandments. His descendants will be mighty on earth. Watch this. The generation of the upright will be blessed. Now, watch this. God says, this man, his generations that come after him are going to walk in the posterity that he set up for them. Watch this, watch this. When I find a mean individual 
or a crazy individual or a leaky head individual. If you're not sure the foreign term leaky head, we got CD in there explaining all to you. I don't have to go back too far to find out where that come from. I can go to one generation for that and find out where the dysfunction came from. Are you still here? Well, watch this. Say, say that man. That man has a generational blessing that affects his family. A generational blessing that affects those that come after him. Why? Because he respected God and obeyed God's will. Point blank, bottom line. Look at your neighbor and say, respect and obey. I said this on Sunday. I will say it again because your neighbor got to get it deep down in a sanctified soul. God never asked you to think. He just asked you to obey. Let me help all of the opinionated I got to say it like it is. Good. You know what I found out? People like that, they normally can't take what they give. They put it out real tough, but when you give it back to them real tough, oh, I don't believe this. I don't understand. I just, oh, my God. No. If you can put it out, man, you sure better be able to handle it. Ain't it, man? <laughs> Let me, that is a uh, slang in African American colloquialism, which which ain't in Maine, simply refers to "Isn't that true, my dear fellow?" <laughs> ain't it, man? <laughs> and now and then the country come out. It's a it's a southern thing, like sweet tea. You know, y'all don't know nothing about that. Y'all just got that. Some of any country, I know I got some country folk, any country folk, and you know about sweet tea and hot sauce on everything, and just the way we do things, all right? Now, <laughs> ain't a man. All right, watch this. Watch this. <laughs> Say the generational blessing. He has a generational blessing now, but watch this, because I got to connect the dots back to that place called the outer darkness. Say it with me, the outer darkness. Look at verse 3. Wealth and riches will be in his house. That means the man has status and substance. Don't you let folks sell you no dream that says God's desire for you is not to have nothing. The books say wealth and riches is going to be in his house. Say my house. my house. The difference is, is you can have stuff, but stuff not have you. The problem is most people get stuff and they lose their mind. Right. <laughs> watch folk, watch folk come to church, ain't got nothing, start using the word. Trusting God, trusting God in their finances, what, and then watch them because after a while they'll think that they don't need him no more. I got some money now. I got some stuff now. And so, I'm, you know, you know, real busy. And the crazy thing is, the one that got you everything you got, how is it that you form in your mind that you can turn your back on him? You got to be crazy. Ain't it, man? <laughs> Watch this. Watch, Watch this. <laughs> and his righteousness endures forever. The word endures means is spoken of forever. It's amazing to me because when the blessing's on you, you can do a lot of wrong, but the only thing people will remember is the good you did. Abraham, we remember him for the blessing. Nobody talks about the fact that he was a liar. He goes and he goes to Pharaoh and he lies and he says, this is my sister. He's a liar. Ball-faced liar. I mean, he the kind of liar, you know, you know folk like this. And it's you just look straight ahead. Uh, they'll look you in the face. I don't remember that. That didn't happen. I got you on tape. I don't know, you know. You signed the disclosure saying you said this. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Doesn't say mm -hmm. <laughs> His righteousness is spoken of forever. We're talking about Abraham 5,000 years later because he had the audacity to respect God and obey God's will. So now watch this. Watch the next verse. Watch it. He says, unto the upright, 
there arises, well, watch this, light in the darkness. Now, 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 wait a minute now. Because we just read about the unprofitable servant that would be cast into the place called, come on now, what, what now? Outer darkness. So this man, even though he's respecting and obeying God, at one point in his life, he finds himself being cast into a place called darkness. And it's not that he sinned. It's not that he didn't do everything right. It was just that there was some stuff God needed to get out of him that he would not do in his comfort zone. So God says, I got to place you in a place, man, called outer darkness. <sighs> that is a place of the unknown of obscurity and the absence of light which means god says when i place you in outer darkness you're not gonna know if you're coming you're not gonna know if you're going you're not gonna know who's for you you're not gonna know who's with you because i put you in a place to do what what does darkness do it starves your senses i wish i had a church what's the problem with your senses your senses representing your flesh adam and eve what they ate was a thought outside of god's will What happened? So now, you can get it. What happened for Adam and Eve is that they got into a place to where they were able to entertain thoughts outside of God. Which means, consequently, they entertained thoughts outside of God's will. They thought about stuff they had no business thinking about because He had given them a specific directive. See, if I tell you, sit up, stand down, turn around, move your head to the side, and sit down. Ain't nothing to pray about. Ain't nothing to fast about. You, you know why we have to fast? We have to fast because you, Adam runs you. Adam them didn't fast. Abraham them, you don't find, oh, I'm just believing God. No, he told me to shut up and sit down. So I shut up and sat down. Blessed be God. Are you hearing what I'm saying? I said, are you hearing what I'm saying? So now watch this, watch this, watch this, watch this. They entertain a thought outside of God, outside of God's will. And in them doing that, it took them to a place now where they are, for Adam, where he's cast out of Eden. And scripture says there's a cherubim flaming like this, keeping him away from Eden. Now, Eden means what? The land of voluptuous living it means uh, it was a place where the river came in all their needs were met everything was taken care of they had the river broke off into multiple streams which represents how you as one individual should have multiple streams flowing in you that way you're not dependent on one thing so if one stream shuts off that's all right because i got three more going on right over here so i'm not threatened by a recession i'm not threatened by any of that because i got so much water flowing my way look at neighbors i got a lot of water flowing my way Watch this. Let me go and connect it. Here it is. Adam gets put out of Eden. He gets put out of the kingdom. Which means he can see Eve and the children enjoying kingdom. But he's over here. Watching. Now no, 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 watch this. Adam's nature. Scripture says the end of uh, chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2. You can go and read it on your own. Uh, it says that and both of them were naked. And they were not ashamed. Very next verse, chapter 3, verse 1. Now the serpent. Now we understand in Genesis, the serpent there has nothing to do with a snake. The word serpent in Hebrew means deceiver. Are you still here? Uh, now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field, all this. Here's what happens. After they partake of their unrighteous stuff, in Bible college, y'all know what really went on. After they partake of that, the Bible says, and the eyes of both of them were open, and they knew they were naked. Which means, at that moment, they stopped living off of God's word and started living off of their senses. At that moment, they stopped living by faith and started walking by sight. 
And so God says, I use outer darkness as a way to starve your senses so you can't see nothing, you can't hear who's coming, you can't taste what's going on. I got to starve your senses because your senses are the reason we're here in the first place. I've had your neighbor say outer darkness. So he says, the purpose of outer darkness. Let me, let me, let me go and connect. Let me go and do it. Go to Isaiah 45. Say, God made that just for me. And he makes this place just for you because he knows you. And he knows you'll holler and scream at church and snot at the altar and all that. And that's wonderful. And you need to do that. And that's great. But he knows you'll do all of that and go home and get right back in the same relationship you knew he told you to get up out of while you was at the altar. Please say something so I have to step off stage. Please. Please say something. You'll come to the altar. Oh, I got my breakthrough. Thank you, Jesus. Ooh, debt free, debt free. And go out and charge your after church dinner. Look at your neighbor and say, he know you. So do. God is not impressed with your facade, and He is not convinced by your Mac and Maybelline. He sees right through all that. You hear what I'm saying? God sees you in the morning when you wake up, and you ain't got none of that on. Daughter, you can't say that. <laughs> say, God makes it. Now, watch this. Watch this. Because here's, here's here, you want to know why you fight darkness? You fight it because you think the devil made it. You fight the times in your life where you don't know where to go and what to do. You fight that because you think, oh, the devil's busy. No! Let, let me help you understand something about, about, about this. About, about, about this. Oh, uh, Isaiah 45, go to verse 5. Son, you ain't reading for, okay, watch this, verse 5. I am the Lord, now right there, that's his covenant name. And there is, what? No other. There is no God besides me. See, what happened is, is in the body of Christ, is we made, and when I say we, the body of Christ made the devil a God's enemy. I need to make an announcement to you, and all of you, Watching online with chicken in your mouth. No, you need to be a chicken. Watch this. God has no enemies. For him to have an enemy, someone would have to have the same exousia or authority he does. And nobody does. Before Satan could go mess with Job, he had to get permission from God. God has no enemies. Now, Satan is your and I enemy, but he is not God's enemy. Bishop, how dost thou knowest this? Because the Bible teaches this. I am the Lord. There is no other. There is no God. There is no source. There is no entity. There is no place. There is no divine except me. I will gird you, though you've not even known me, that they may know from the rising of the sun to its setting there is none besides me. Watch this. God says, I'm so cold, I'll protect you when you didn't even know you needed protection. God says, while you were out clubbing and partying and hollering and all this and juking and all that, God says, I was protecting you and I was covering you and you didn't even know you needed to be covered. While you were a fool, I was covering you. That's why that wreck didn't kill you. That's why that bullet couldn't stop you. That's why that wreck couldn't take you. Because God says, I am the Lord and besides me, there ain't. Verse 7, let me just say this real quick for, for your neighbor. God plays chess with himself. He'll take a move, sit back, walk on the other side of the table, and make another move. Because at the end of the day, he says, I didn't make no junk. 
I didn't make no trash. I didn't make no losers. So I'm playing chess with myself to get the best result. No, 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 no. Watch this. Verse 7. Touch your neighbor and say, this is the verse. Touch, I mean, shake their arm. Shake it off. Tell them this is the Shake it off. This is the verse. Watch this. Watch this. Now, what are we talking about? This place called what? The outer darkness. Watch this. God says, I'm the one that forms the light. And I'm the one that creates the darkness. You, 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 you didn't get that. God says, it ain't the devil. God said, that place called outer darkness you may find yourself in, I made it. Which means if I made it, stop worrying about whether or not it's going to kill you and take you out. If I made it, I'll never put more on you than you've got the ability to bear. So if I made the darkness, it's a custom-made darkness just for you. And I needed to push you to the edge because you hard-headed. So I'll let you get real close where you think you're about to fall out. But what you didn't know is I made it and I made it fail-proof. Which means it's going to work. Touch your neighbor say it's going to work. Look at this. I form the light and create the darkness. Now literally in Hebrew the word light there means good. And the word darkness means evil. Which means God says sometimes when, when stuff cramps up and stops, I'm the one that shut it down. It's just like a woman when she's having contractions. Contracting. 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 And I was watching this on TLC the other day. <laughs> and then, and then, and then she thinks, oh, it's going to come. The water broke. But then it shuts down. Uh, watch this. Uh, the children of Israel, Moses, go to Pharaoh. Tell him to let you go. But Moses, by the way, just so you know, I've already told him to tell you no. Go to him 10 times. And just so you know, Moses, I'm the one that's telling him to say no. It wasn't the devil closing the door. It was me preparing you to be patient. It was me teaching you how to persevere. It was me teaching you how not to give up. See, the problem with some folk you know is that they want to give up and quit on everything, which means they don't deserve anything. He, he said, contractions, Moses. It looked like it's going to happen. You going in there, you walking in there strong. Got your rod, you throw your rod down, snake, your snake, eat they snake. And then I shh, shut it down. I open it up, and I shut it down. I open it up, and I shut it down. Because I am God, and beside me, there's nobody. So I made the light. And I'm the, also the one that created the place called outer darkness. Now, now, look at this. Look at this. I make peace. And I create calamity. I just don't understand why everything's just going. It's just I don't understand. I do. Sometimes you won't do stuff until there's controversy. Please say something. S sometimes you won't change until you are placed in a predicament to where you ain't got no choice. I know that's not appropriate English. To where you have no choice. And God says, I know this about y'all. Y'all change one or two times. When you learn enough that you want to, or you hurt enough that you have to. So God says, my question to you is how long you want to be in the darkness? 
Because see, in the darkness, I'm starving your senses. I'm starving Adam. He can't see. And that makes him angry because you know what? He can't control. And that's what gets you angry about some of your circumstances is what you're really angry is about the fact that you can't control what's going on. And you're so used to sitting in the driver's seat of your life. You're so used to sitting in the pilot seat of your life. God says, all right, I'm going to throw this thing up. I'm going to put you in total darkness where you can't see nothing. Which means you can't control anything anymore. Which means it's not on your terms anymore. You don't get to call the shots. You don't get to say, rise, come, sit down, shout. You don't get to say nothing. You don't run nothing. You can't hear. Why? Because after a point now, you're sitting in this place called outer darkness. So it's the equivalent almost of a padded room, which means all of what you say is absorbed, which means you can't even hear God. You can't taste can't smell and here's the deal you can't feel and this is what happens when your feelings start going through all these changes and all this God says mm -hmm. that's called outer darkness and I made that place just for you look at the neighbor and say he made it just for you let's take it home go to Psalm 112 let's finish this you learning ah uh, what's this Now, let's, let's, let's follow the progression. Outer darkness is a place that comes as a result of God needing to get fruit out of you, needing to get profit out of you, needing to pull and extract that which you did not even know you had out of you. The thing about God is he has predicaments where he can pull stuff out of you that you didn't even know was there. He can pull stuff out of you that you didn't even think you had the propensity nor the proclivity to do. And he's looking and he's saying, but I know it's there. We have this treasure. In earthen vessels. Now, here's the thing about treasure. Touch your neighbor and say, you're a treasure. Treasure don't know how much value it has. If you've ever, if you ever, you know, if you ever, you know, deep sea diving and you find a treasure, you open the treasure up, you see gold coins, they have no clue how much they're worth. You understand, everything has an ear to hear, so, uh, you know, I, I, can, I can personify the coins. He, 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 treasure has no clue what it's worth. Treasure only has value to one that has the ability Some of y'all shaking, y'all know what the, what the last phrase is. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You don't even know what I'm saying. Treasure is only valuable to the one that finds it and knows how to properly dispose and use it. That's why God gives you and brings you to a man of God where the man of God can open you up and start saying, you know, this and this and this and that and that because you have no clue how to unlock yourself. If you could have, you would have done it a long time ago. Look at your neighbor and say, I'm a treasure. Got to be unlocked. So watch this. Watch this. Watch this. Watch this. Watch this. Verse 4. Unto the upright, the man who respects and obeys God's will. Now, so one of the other purposes of darkness is to break your legs. Which your legs represent your what? Your will. God says darkness breaks your will. Because see, again, since you're not in control, you'll finally learn how to give it up. Be out of control for a while and then you'll learn it'll be real easy to give it up. Are you listening? So God says, watch this, unto the upright there arises light in darkness. The word light there, now it means, what did we tell you? It means the knowledge of God. Watch this, in this passage it also means hope. He says, unto that man arises hope in the darkness. Well, why does he have hope? Let's read the next verse to find out what he didn't have when he went up in the darkness. He is gracious. Darkness will make you learn how to have grace with folk. Being in the darkness will make you learn how to have patience and talk to folk and be nice and love on folk that you never thought you'd ever do. Darkness has a way of making you gracious. Read it. And full of compassion. Darkness has a way to make you compassionate. Now, you ever seen somebody that's been on top of the world and they were mean and all this and then they fall down real, real low and they fall real low. All of a sudden, they're the nicest person in the world. What taught them that? 
darkness. Selfish folk. I don't ever worry about selfish folk. Folk will be selfish and all that. But you know, I gave this to the church. Okay. Cool. Because after a while, that darkness is going to be show sure enough to get that selfishness out of you. Look at your neighbor and say, show sure enough. Sure enough. Right, sis. And righteous. Darkness will make you live right. <laughs> It'll make you act right. When you're in darkness long enough, you're just, Lord, whatever you want to do, do it. Just hurry up. Please get me out of this darkness. Do what you got to do. I'm ready. Lord, if you can use anybody, use me. You start singing songs, making commitments, all this kind of stuff. You better alter every week. Say, God, get me out of this darkness because darkness will make you stand right. Dark, see, watch this. Watch this. Darkness has a way of bringing you to God like nothing else. Darkness has, and darkness doesn't mean that you lose everything. It's just it's all of what we spoke of and what's indicative of what I've said. Darkness has a way of making you come to God like you've never come to him before. And the question is, look at the neighbor and say, here's the question. The question is, is how much darkness you need for you change? Now you might say, well, I, you know, I, I ain't got sin problems. See, that's not even what he's trying to fix in you. He's trying to fix that right there, that judgmental spirit. That's what he's trying to fix, and that's what the darkness for. Uh-huh, that's what he's trying to fix. Well, you know, my finances are fine. Mm -hmm, that's exactly it, because you're stingy. That's why they're fine, because you don't get it. He's trying to fix that right there. That's what he's trying to fix. Mm-hmm, sure enough. Mm-hmm. Watch this. Watch this. A good man deals graciously and lends. So God says the darkness is going to not only give you grace, but when you come up out of the darkness, you'll no longer be the one that's borrowing. Watch this. He will guide his affairs with what? Discretion. Darkness teaches you wisdom like nothing else. Darkness, watch it. Darkness will teach you how to watch out and how to pray and how to discern before you start rushing into stuff and rushing into relationship with folk and all that. Darkness has a way of making you being prudent like you've never seen yourself before. You'll start asking questions after you've been through the darkness. You didn't even know and have the intellect to ask. What, 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 what's this? What's this? Surely he will never be shaken. Watch this. I wish y'all were receiving this in the Holy Ghost because you'd be shouting right through here. Uh, God says, after you've come through the darkness and I've shaken everything I could shake, you'll look at stuff that comes in your life and say, man, all the hell I've had to go through, this is not. Paul, when he got shipwrecked on that island of Malta, he said, I have been through this, I have been stoned to death, I've been beat to death, I've been locked up, and you think this little snake is going to stop me? He took that, that snake and he shook it off in the fire and he said, man, you don't know who you're messing with. I've been through the darkness and hope came up. Uh, what's this? What, what, what's this? Watch this, because y'all getting homie. Watch this. Watch this. Watch this. But you, but you got to get this. Watch this. Watch this. The righteous will be in everlasting remembrance. Watch this. He will not be afraid of evil tidings. Now, all of this happens because he endured the darkness. When you go through darkness, you don't care what anybody has to say about you anymore. Please, y'all, say something. I'll stop it right here. When you go through darkness, you ain't caring about no gossips. You ain't caring about no slanderers. You ain't caring about no fools. You ain't caring about no bog. You ain't caring about, talk about me, man, because you don't know. I didn't been through the darkness, and so I'm not afraid of evil tidings. Say what you got to say, because. Look at your neighbor and say, I'm too legit to quit. Sure enough. I had them pants, you know, I, hammer time. What's this? What's this? What's this? Say so he's not afraid of gossips, slanders, or fools. How many adjustments do you make because of fools? Now, let me give you the definition of a fool. A fool is one who doesn't know God. Or one who lives as if they don't know God. Which means you can be a saved fool. Because you can live like you don't know God. What do you mean, Bishop? I'm glad you asked. Uh, you can live your life in such a way 
that all you are is a Christian by paper. And the only, the only reason folk know you saved is because you wear your church t-shirt to work on Fridays when it's dressed down. <laughs> Other than that, watch this, watch this. His heart is steadfast, trusting in the Lord. His heart is established. Watch this. After the darkness, this man knows how to make up his mind. And it's steadfast. And he realizes there's some stuff. See, darkness will make you stop settling. I'll say it again. Darkness will make you stop settling. There's some stuff that you knew you'd been settling for, knew it was below what God called you, knew it wasn't what you was and you settled for it. But darkness has a way of making you make your mind up and say, I'm not settling. If I got to be by myself, I'll take myself to the movie. I'll take myself to the show because I'm not going to sit around. I've been through darkness. Th this, ain't, this ain't scary. And I sat in darkness. But my mind's made up. I won't settle and I won't ignore red flags anymore. I'm setting y'all up for Sunday is what I'm doing. Watch this. Verse 8. His heart is established. Watch this. He will not be afraid. Watch this. If you do not shout here, you need to get saved. And I'm, I'm, I'm serious. Ain't man. Watch this. His heart is what? Verse 8. Established. He will not be a what? Darkness is what removes fear. Who's the neighbor say, I have no fear? Because I've been through darkness. Darkness, an uncomfortable place. So I'm not scared anymore because I've been uncomfortable. I've had to walk uncomfortable. I've had to stand in front of folk uncomfortable. I'm talking to somebody in here tonight. I've had to be uncomfortable. So this does not scare me anymore. And what used to petrify me, I look at it now. <laughs> Watch this. Now, if you do not shout, again, elders going to be at the church, open doors of the church so you can get saved by the church. He will not be afraid, watch this, until he sees his desire upon his enemies. Now, an enemy is anything, not just people, an enemy is anything that opposes your forward progress. This man that's been through the darkness says, I'm not going to be afraid until I see the thing that was stopping me turn into what I want it to be. Which means what used to stop me, I'm looking at it, telling it what it's got to do. Telling it what it's got to be. Joseph's brothers thought they were stopping him. But at the end of the book, they had to come and beg him. You better say something to me. He, he said... This man's not afraid until he sees his desire, not God's desire, which means God says when you survive the darkness, you tell me what happens to your enemies and I'll do it. You, you tell me what you want to have happen and I'll do it. Oh, oh, oh. That's why I don't get scared when folk talk about me and don't like me and won't say what they want to say. What you going to say, man? Do it. Because if you for one second think I'm studying you, if you, man, I've been through darkness. If you for one second think I'm interested in your opinion, who ain't never accomplished nothing, ain't got nothing, so ain't got no fruit. If you for one second think I care, you are deceived. And you ought not think that highly about yourself. Look at the neighbor and say, I love you, but ain't studying what you got to say about me. Uh -huh, show not. Mm -hmm, show enough. Show enough. Show enough. Show enough. Mm hmm. Cold blood and ain't it, man? Watch this. Let's take this home. He has dispersed abroad, which means he becomes a giver. He's given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. Now watch this. His horn, say strength. The word horn here means strength. Will be exalted with honor, which means God says, what you're strong at, I will cause you to be honored for. Which God says, what this means is that all of what you don't do well, we ain't going to talk about that. But what you're strong at, I'll cause you to be honored for that. 
Which means God says, I'll get you jobs you don't deserve. I'll get you in front of folk you don't have no business talking to. I'll get you auditions you ain't got no business going on. I'll get you in places you have no business being because what your strength is, I will exalt that. You know, the thing about a mountain, I, I was traveling last week and, 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 you know, looked like mountains like right here, you know. But I'm not a, you know, skier and all that. I don't believe in all that. This gets my religion. <laughs> the Bible says be wise. And I just, you know, going down a mountain with, with two sticks and, and some big house shoes. I just have a... It's not for me. I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm just saying that, you know, God is going to have to tell me to go do that. The thing about a mountain is a mountain makes a valley look very insignificant. Every, before every mountain has to be a valley because that's the nature of topography. That's the nature of the geography. That's how mountains create it. So before every mountain, there is a valley, but no one pays attention to the valley because they're focusing all their attention on the mountain. God says, that's how I'll do with you. All of the stuff you're not good at will be insignificant. Because when you survive the darkness, touch your neighbor so you better survive the darkness. When you survive the darkness, the only thing people are going to be paying, it to, uh, paying attention to is the mountain. Which means everything you can't do, everything you don't know, everything you can't do, every degree you didn't get, every school you didn't graduate from, every diploma you didn't get, God says, we ain't even talking about that. We're talking about your strength. This is your Bible. Touch your neighbor and say, this is in your Bible. Watch this. Last verse. Here we go. Now, because you said, Bishop, what this got to do with all that weeping and gnashing of teeth you're talking about? Right here. The wicked will see it and be grieved. Grieved with what? Well, with jealousy. Here it is. He will gnash his teeth and melt away. The desire of the wicked shall perish several things i need you to see here several things i need you to see here this is where the bad steward remember the unprofitable one the one that produced no fruit this is where he was cast now watch it scripture says the wicked will see it and be grieved grieved with what jealousy or regret i need y'all to connect these dots now remember in matthew 25 verse 30 Cast the unprofitable servant uh, into the outer darkness, period. There will be, which means when he got cast there, he wasn't weeping and gnashing his teeth. But after he spent a little time there, he started weeping and gnashing his teeth. Which means God says, my greatest catalyst for changing you is regret. He, he said, the wicked will see it and be grieved presumptuously with jealousy he will gnash his teeth and melt away the desire of the wicked shall perish what was this? the place where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth is a place in your life where you're sitting saying i shoulda i woulda i coulda darkness when you when see now again here's the problem because you start thinking darkness though will make you start examining what you should have done, what you would have done, and what you could have done. Look at your neighbor and say, but it was a setup. God says, it's a setup because when you go to outer darkness, unknown, obscurity, the absence of light, when you go there, you determine how long you're going to spend in that place. And if you decide that you're going to continue to fight me, and I said this on Sunday, and come at me like you're a grown man. God says, as many who are the kingdom are the ones that approach me with childlike faith. They come to me like a child. A child comes and is hungry for knowledge. A child comes and says, what I got to do? They want to learn. They want to grow. And I told you on Sunday, that's why I terrible too. They call them terrible too because that's when a person begins to develop a will. You understand? There's no such thing as bad kids. It's just kids who never got their legs. And so God says, I got a thing called county that'll break them legs. 
So either you use the rod I gave you, or I'll use my rod. But either way, I'm going to get profit. I'm going to get fruit. Touch your neighbor and say, he's going to get it. Either way. No, 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 no. Watch this. Watch this because I'm through. The wicked will see it and be grieved. He'll gnash his teeth and melt away. The desire of the wicked shall perish. Several things. First thing is, people will hate you for what you're good at. Now, when I say statements like that, don't have a broad view of everybody and walk around arrogant thinking everybody got a problem with you. So you walk in a room and no one spoke to me because I'm just anointed. No, you got a bad attitude. That ain't the anointing. Because <laughs> see, that thing that makes you speak in tongue, that Holy Ghost, he'll teach you how to act right too. I said, uh, but people sometimes may hate you for what you're good at. And in their hatred for what you're good at, it shows you what your assignment is. Wherever you experience a lot of attack in your life, you need to look and say, what is it that the devil knows that I don't know about myself? Because if I'm experiencing a lot of hell in this area, that's because that's an assignment for me. Just the neighbor say, I just helped you. I just saved you $17 on buying a book about finding your purpose. <laughs> Last thing. That's thing. God says, if you're unprofitable, got to go to outer darkness. You determine how long you stay there, which means you can stay there so short that you don't have to get to the place to where you start weeping and gnashing your teeth. That phrase just means regret. Let, 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 me, just, let me just ask you some sobering questions as you get ready to eat tomorrow. And while you're eating, I hope the Holy Ghost bothers you the whole time you're sitting at the table. I hope he does. How much more do you have to take before you change? And this is for everybody because, see, this place called darkness, remember, remember how we started out in Psalm 112? The man wasn't a sinner. He wasn't doing nothing wrong. But there was some stuff God needed to get out of him that only darkness would pull out of him. Question is, though, is, is how, how, how much more? You heard God clearly. It's been clear. How much? Look at your name and say, how much? How much more does he have to do? I was talking uh, 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 a while ago to, to one of my sons. And let me just go on and say this since I got the mic and, you know, this whole thing about people hating you for what you're good at. And uh, a man got upset uh, in the church and, and uh, he got upset because he said, why they call him dad? <laughs> I'm thinking, I ain't got nothing to do with you, man. I, I don't want you to call me that. You get, you know, use a bad advertisement. Why they call him dad? And so I taught about this years a year ago. Taught about all this. Where's that in the Bible? Where's that in the Bible to actually do that? Well, well I saw all that. And, and come to find out this person's real problem is that their natural children won't do that for them. And so I thought to myself, I said, self. <laughs> self answered and said, yes. I said, why is it that an individual would get so angry about something that had nothing to do with them? He said, because I just wanted you to know that your assignment is unbreakable. Amen. Stop tripping when folk walk out. Let them go. If it ain't no curb to kick them to, build them a curb and kick them to it. I thought that was interesting. I thought it was interesting. Uh, here's the deal. How, how much does it take? And my thought is, is why not sit and learn? Amen. Obviously, you need to learn, you know. <laughs> you know, obviously. That's that. Here's the deal, Harvest. And, and 
all those that get the CD and watch it online, uh, 2010 is supposed to be the best year of your life yet. You believe that? I'm through. 2010 is supposed to be the best year of your life yet. Matter of fact, after 2010, 2011 should be the best year. I'm not ending 2009 dreading it. You know, you'd be so happy to leave one thing that you just run into anything. Say something, so I ain't got to get off this stage. I know I'm a little rough tonight. <laughs> I'm hungry, you know. <laughs> Y'all pray for me. If you dread what you're exiting, you will run into anything. And how you end a thing determines how you start a thing. And I'm not ending 2009 and saying, Ooh, I'm so glad it's over. Because God has already given me a word, and I, I'll tell it to you on watch night, for what 2010 is going to do for you, particularly the first three months. But, but, I, but I, need, I need you to hear this. I need you to hear this. I need you to hear this. How much more darkness do you need? 